people of the United States. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Hello, and welcome to George Washington Slept Here, the civic education podcast from Freedom's Foundation at Valley Forge, where we explore American history, civics, and the idea of liberty through conversations with some of our favorite thinkers, writers, and leaders. I'm Jason Rea, Chief Operating Officer at Freedom's Foundation and host of George Washington Slept Here. The format is simple, a long-form conversation with a friend of Freedom's Foundation where everyone can learn something new. Before we go any further, a little housekeeping. We encourage everyone to subscribe to George Washington Slept Here wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure you get every new episode as soon as it is out. We love hearing from our listeners, and so please feel free to email us at gwshpodcast at gmail.com with your comments, questions, or suggestions, and hit us up at Freedoms Foundation social media at FFVF on Twitter and on Facebook and Instagram at Freedoms Foundation. Today's interview is with Freedoms Foundation friend and political philosopher Joe Fornieri. Hey, Joe. Hey, delighted to be here. Our conversation today is going to be structured in a way to keep us on track. We want to explore your origin story. How did you become the person sitting before us? Your current work, which includes, I know, a book on Frederick Douglass that you're working on. Then I want to talk about the state of America today. And finally, we will end with a quiz, which hopefully will allow listeners to learn something new uh, before we leave. So... Uh, tell us where you were born and raised, Joe. I was actually born in Buffalo, and I remain a Buffalo Bills fan, but uh, I was raised in Rochester, New York, the home of Frederick Douglass. Ah, so there's the connection right off. Right. He's in the air. He is in the air, and um, I think that there's been a lot of great work in uh, recognizing his tremendous legacy in in the past uh, 10, 15 years in in Rochester and, and throughout the country. Um, I went to a public school, Fairport High School. I wrestled, played football. Uh, uh, my junior year, I took up guitar, which has been a lifelong friend of mine. Um, I then went to SUNY Geneseo, where I had a real conversion experience. There was a professor there, a very challenging professor named Dr. Deutsch, um, who uh, really inspired me and um, uh, changed my life as a, as a teacher. I uh, was considering going to law school, and I, de- I decided, uh, I don't know, senior year, this happens sometimes. I, I just had had enough of, 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 of school, mm-hmm. and I spent a year um, playing music in, in pubs around Europe, came back, and then decided to uh, get my Ph.D. I went to Boston College for two years, um, studied with uh, Father Fortin, was in oh, the, Ernie Fortin. Ernie Fortin. So you know that's my undergraduate, was it, it, and my graduate was at Boston College, and I knew Ernie. I never knew, uh, yeah. knew Ernie. So, yes, uh, he was yes, a remarkable uh, person. Absolutely. He had a he had a mischievous twinkle in his eye uh, as a priest. He he he, he kind of liked the the bad boys, the the renegades, and uh, he was just a, he was a great. Uh, thinker and a, a great in, instructor and mm-hmm. uh, kind of took me under his wing. I was going to do my dissertation on Dante. I then went to Catholic University and studied under uh, David Walsh, um, there, Phil Henderson, uh, Klaus Rinn. There was a, a group of uh, uh, folks at, at Catholic University and um, did my uh, doctoral dissertation on um Abraham Lincoln and and Lincoln's view of religion and politics and and that that became my my first book and the basis of my first book in 2003 uh I play uh music in a in a blues band uh probably a couple times a month with my brother and my uh nephew Joey who's kind of a prodigy um, and uh, another friend drummer, uh, Mike Morgan. So we're called the Four Neri Brothers Band nice. on Facebook. Nice. So uh, let's, been, ta- let's yeah, talk teach- a little bit about the music, though, mm-hmm. because that's really been important to you. Obviously, you took that year off 
Um, you know, tell us a little bit about spending that year playing in Europe. That seems um, like a, amazing, but also allowed you to sort of, you know, gave you the time and space to figure out what we were going you were going to do next and and with the rest of your life. It really did because as I mentioned, I was I was going to go to law school and um, when I went to Europe, I went with my best friend, a guy named Craig Delancey, who interestingly enough became a um, professor of philosophy at Oswego, you know, mm. highly published, and he's also a science fiction writer. So he went there to, you know, we were young and, and, and you know, optimistic and romantic, and we, you know, he wanted to be a, a, a writer and I wanted to be a musician, so we kind of slummed it in, in London, but it was a great experience. I really... I worked on my guitar playing. I, I got down a very broad repertoire of songs. I traveled extensively, and I met a lot of different uh, personalities. I did. Um, I could. I guess I could say this now. I'm not going to get in trouble. <laughs> my my um, sojourn was interrupted, um, probably for the best, because I I had been in Italy where I was playing and traveling. And I got stopped at Heathrow Airport uh -oh. and um, in, interrogated. And essentially, uh, you know, I was, I was there without, I had extended my visa uh. in London. And that was, you know, that was wrong. And I got, I got caught red-handed and so I, I got deported. Uh. I, was, I was sent back to the United States. So your your, your European uh, musical sojourn was over. It was, was, it was over. And I'm, I'm happy to say that I've had a wonderful career at the uh, Rochester Institute of Technology for the past almost 25 years. I've yeah. really, I really loved it. I mean, you hear a lot of, you know, people complaining about higher ed and, and it's been, it's been a very great experience. I love my students. I've had a very good relationship with the uh, administration there. We have, we're a unique institution at RIT because, uh, the cliche is that we attract students who are both right and left brained. We have we have a, a engineering school, hard sciences, and then we have a design school in video gaming and uh, photojournalism. So it's 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 really a great mix, and uh, I'm proud to say my daughter goes there. Oh, uh, no, that's very cool. So, so tell us what tell us what you're teaching. I know because you're you have, and and then we'll talk about the center. But tell us about your your classes and and the students who are are coming to your classes. Yeah, thank you. I I um for the past 25 years, I've done a bread and butter American politics class. And um, you know, you always I think to be an effective teacher, you always want to find. Um, uh, ways to keep things fresh in American politics just because current events keep things fresh, but you don't sure. want to toss out the the tried and true. Um, so that's been enjoyable for me, you know, and it's it's fresh. It's a new group of students. I taught in the interval when I did come back from Europe. I taught uh, at a place called Bishop Kearney High School for three years. Okay. So I taught advanced placement, American and European history and regions, and that, that really helped my my teaching and help me reach freshman students. Okay. So uh, I, ha I always have a double section of that is my bread and butter staple. Um, I work with a lot of primary documents um, um, with the students, but I also give them the nuts and bolts, which, as you know, our civic literacy is not at the highest level. But so uh, we, we are definitely going to yeah, talk about that a little yeah, bit later. I think, yes. I think we have to, uh, you know, uh, presume that they, they, they don't know too much, not in an not in arrogant way, but in an in invitation to get them up to, up to uh, a higher level. And I've taught, I've taught all over the spectrum, which is, which is this wonderful thing about RIT. I just, last semester I did a class on uh, Roman Republicanism. Ah, it was the first which time Which, of I, course, we know is a huge influence on the founders. Absolutely. Uh, and on our own constitution and what was happening just down the road in Philadelphia. And that, and that was the hook. And I was actually surprised here with this wonderful Frederick Douglass seminar we've had this week. How many of our secondary teachers were really interested and wanted more mm. on that subject? It was a you know I'm I'm tenured so but it was a bit of a risk still. I had sure. not I had not taught. I was concerned the students would you know really not like this material. But I was pleasantly surprised. You know they liked reading about Cicero. They liked reading Plutarch's history. Um, 
It really is. A, 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 you know, Rome is a remarkable history, and, and there's, there's heroes, there's villains, there's great ideas, and, and it had a profound uh, influence on our own self-government, right, in terms of both Absolutely. Uh, a cautionary tale and uh, a standard. Right, because we know the Republic eventually succumbs to empire. Exactly. And so there is always that question mm-hmm. of how long can this last? And it's it's one of the things that periodically, and we see ebbs and flows, but every once in a while, there is this thought that comes and you, and you see long think pieces on it of, is are we coming to the end of the American century? Or are we coming to the right. end of American influence? And it is very much that, are we Rome? Right. There's you know, actually a book written on that topic. <laughs> oh, really? Great. Yes. Are we Rome? Yeah. But I, I'll teach. I teach rhetoric, which has been a lot, a lot of fun, and I think that's been very successful in um, assisting students with writing. We we talk about you know while we're all concerned about the you know bringing up writing skills, and there's something about the the tested and tried and the old. <laughs> rhetorical um, uh, standards in assisting students become better writers, you know, kind of have to have to, you know, adapt them a little bit to modern times. But so I teach rhetoric, I teach political philosophy, I teach one of my big topics um, is the First Amendment and free speech and constitutional rights and liberties. And certainly one of uh, one of those topics that Freedoms Foundation is deeply interested in and, and teaches about both with teachers and students is First Amendment rights, but also what are our responsibilities that go along with that? I tend to be an absolutist that the First Amendment is, there, there's very little that's not protected, but it's, uh, it's a great conversation and, and engaging young people especially are there limits and you know what is the the depth and breadth of the freedom of speech and expression and press and religion and and all of that and we've seen it play out more and more in our courts and in public opinion in certainly in the last five years I think more than I've ever experienced it yes it's certainly been a, a hot topic um, I think that there it, it, the pe- you know it's something of a cliche to talk about the pendulum, but the, I think the pendulum was swinging in one direction perhaps 10, 15 years ago in terms of restricting speech mm-hmm. and, and protecting certain marginalized groups. Um, now I think the pendulum is swinging um, back in terms of protecting um, speech. Right. And I think that's good. I, I think we can have it both ways. One of my great heroes is Nadine Strawson. I recommend right. everyone to, sure. to read her, to read her work. Um, and she's spoken at Rochester several times, just a remarkable, uh, thinker and, in and, and personally an, an individual. She's a real, real hero out there for free speech and so principled. You know, in terms of defending speech on on both sides, right? Uh, that's the that's the type of people, to my mind, we need out there um, <clears throat> who have that legitimacy and credibility. Um, I was grateful for the opportunity last year to to hold a seminar here at Freedoms Foundation on free speech, and we had a we had a uh, just a, I thought a great lineup of high school teachers from throughout the country, and that's important too because. Um, Diversity comes in many forms, and uh, the geographic diversity right. can be very uh, quite interesting as well. And to listen to teachers from different states yeah. at the secondary level, and and what are the guidelines, and what are they facing, and what what is the censorship in that state as opposed to another state? Right. <laughs> what, right. what is offense? What is considered offensive in one state may be, may be orthodoxy in another state. So notwithstanding, uh, you know, the fact that we've, we've become more uniform, there's still a great deal of pluralism in the United States. Well, that, and, and, and that's what I was just going to say is this, uh, the diversity of ideas uh, is another important form of diversity. And you get that when you have that geographic diversity. You get that when you have, you know, people who experience the world differently and they, they, they grow their, their own ideas. And then, you know, we sit down and talk about them. And in and, and some ways we negotiate them with, you know, what is your idea and what is my idea and how do we bring that, uh, bring those together and, and, and find 
um, common ground, which we, which we are, are going to talk about. But I want to first talk about the Center for Statesmanship, Law, and Liberty, which is your center at RIT. Um, tell me why statesmanship and law and liberty and, and what it is your center does. <laughs> Yeah, to use a musical metaphor, this is a triad. <laughs> <laughs> Statesmanship, law, and liberty, right? Statesmanship must be mindful of the rule of law, and and the end of statesmanship and the rule of law is to further liberty and, and human flourishing. We could, we could say life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but we shortened it to liberty. <laughs> um, so these, <laughs> these are all important uh, considerations of a, a just and... Um, successful uh, government. And I, um, as someone who has studied Lincoln and lived with him for the past 25 years, but not only Lincoln, I, I had um, was very interested in, in, in other great leaders. Um, my mentor at SUNY Geneseo in Boston College, a guy named Kishore Mantian, um, devoted quite a bit of time to Gandhi. So mm. I would teach leadership and different types of leadership and I thought that they had, there's a lot of places that teach leadership, but I thought that the role of statesmanship, of political leadership per se, needed to be highlighted. I also thought it was important to um, consider the the role, the, the unique role of the American founding, right? Um, and, and and to include that and to preserve that. I also, being a, uh, a high school teacher, part of my mission was to was outreach. Right to to both high school students, that, you know, committed high school students, and to uh, secondary teachers to work with them. That was one of the missions of the center. And so we have we hold um, uh, annual um, uh, seminars on on you know specific topics dealing with statesmanship and leadership. Uh, we had, you know, for example, we went to the Seward House. We went to Susan B. Anthony's house in Rochester. Um, the Tubman House isn't too far from where we are. And um, <clears throat> I thought that, as I mentioned, there, there's a lot of kind of different interpretations of leadership, and I think that's good. There's, you know, the kind of the the business model of sure. leadership is salesmanship. I, I think that catches an element. But I kind of wanted to preserve the the traditional understanding of leadership as the, as the pinnacle, the apex of political greatness, and to talk about uh, old virtues like like practical wisdom or prudence and, and courage and, and, and fortitude as they're displayed in the political realm and taking into consideration the rule of law. And that, of course, means the study of the, you know, the the bad example of tyranny, right? right. And and considering tyranny, so I was fortunate enough to um, to have some initial initial seed money to support. You know, my center is non nonpartisan. I think it's in, I make that I make that clear. I'm not here to um, indoctrinate. And that's and that's one of the things and, that connected yes. us to you was you know we we can share. The same values, the value of of liberty and the value of the Constitution, but we both, both as individuals, but as organizations, Freedom's Foundation, your center, uh, come at it from this nonpartisan point of view that this is not about indoctrination. It is it is about engagement. It is about talking about what is incredibly important. Um, and but in a way that everybody can be part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious uh, what your take on, you know, so you're, you're studying statesmanship and you're looking at the past all the way back to the Roman Republic, at least mm -hmm. um, our American founding. Um, there are lessons galore amongst the great statesmen, but also amongst the worst, you know, you, you, you whether they're the Romans examples. like, you know, Nero and Caligula yeah. and health all, and, all, you know, health and disease to uh, um, use a, uh, uh, but medical I, analogy. Yeah. But you know, but I'm, I'm curious if you're, and again, in a nonpartisan and, and not in a political way, but do you think political leaders today uh, have a, uh, a good understanding of the kinds of, of statesmanship that you are trying to teach your students? Pass. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> uh, 
I, I, uh, <laughs> and I don't, I don't mean any particular one, no, you know, but I, I, it does feel like I there think there's was, a deficit. You know, I think were, we all could admit there's a, on both sides of the spectrum, there's a deficit of leadership and it's, it's concerning. So let me ask you this question. Um, if, if you could give one primary source text to every politician out there, what would you want them to read? Oh, wow. That's a great question. I think I would want them to read Abraham Lincoln's Peoria Address of 1854. So you have to tell us and our listeners about it. This is this is one of my favorite uh, Lincoln speeches. I know people usually select the Gettysburg Address, which is of course only 217, 272 words, and you know profound and poetic at the same time, or the Second Inaugural. But the the Peoria Address uh, was in response to the Kansas-Nebraska Act of, of 1854, which Lincoln believed, you know, was was going to nationalize slavery, and Lincoln provided a magisterial um, uh, critique of slavery on moral, historical, legal, and political grounds uh, in this speech. He integrates, he weaves all these different. Um, uh, considerations into the speech and attacks slavery on different levels. There's even a uh, very moving and profound uh, critique of slavery based on the slaveholders' intuitive recognition uh, of the wrong of slavery and the mm. in recognition of the common humanity of the slave and 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 empathy, uh, even empathy with the slave. Um, so. Sympathy, I should say. Um, and in the midst of doing this, Lincoln provides, much like Frederick Douglass, a critique of the American regime, but also a vindication of its core principles. And he displays a moderate, prudent statesmanship that tries to further the principle of equality for all human beings under the circumstances of the 19th century. So this would be a great <laughs> speech for everybody to read because it's a rhetorical masterpiece uh, in style. Uh, the substance is profound. Uh, you know, I refer to Lincoln in my in one of my books as a philosopher statesman right. uh, of greatness of both um, thought and action, speech and deed. And we see this uh, in his speech as he, this speech marks the emergence of Lincoln in 1854. He comes out of, comes out of retirement from, you know, he had been practicing his law career and he, he re-enters politics. And that it's a couple of years before the great debates. Yes, uh, with, four with, years. You yep. know, with, with Stephen Douglas and then six years before the election that brings him to Washington. And so um, tell us the name again so people can. Yes, it's October 16th, 1854, Lincoln's speech at Peoria, Illinois. And sometimes it's called the Peoria spe speech. Sometimes it's, it's called, it's referred to Lincoln's speech on the Kansas-Nebraska Act. But that's the date, October 16th, 1854. And um, it, it still is accessible today. I think in, in reading this, just one more example, I think for the historical purpose, Lincoln provides a historical overview of the founders' intent to restrict slavery and the problem of slavery from the revolutionary era up to his own time. And he discusses the various compromise. And like an, the incredible lawyer that, that he is, right. he, he, this overview is provided with such clarity uh, in cogency, it's you know maybe maybe a three four page uh, overview. It's it's one of the best uh, um, summaries you could get right. <laughs> of that complex right. Uh, era. Right, and that's and that's of course it's through Lincoln's lens. Yeah, I, I recognize absolutely. that. absolutely. And it's, and Lincoln has a particular lens. And, yes, and uh, but it is this or idea that the the uh, in in this particular way when it comes to the institution of slavery, as well as others, that the revolution is unfinished. Yes. And, and that, you know, it will, um, and, and some might argue that, you know, in, in some ways the revolution continues even today, that one of the things I love talking to young people about is this idea that 
um, you know, the, the, the miracle story of the, the founders is they created the parameters, they laid the foundation for the growth of liberty year on year on year. Uh, and we, we certainly, you know, the, the, the first, the, the, maybe the, you know, one of the biggest challenges is, of course, slavery, and, and we end up in the Civil War. But then, uh, you know, women uh, and the 19th Amendment, you know, are brought into sure. this liberty. Yeah, and, the and, tent. And, and, and that big tent. And so, so I'm curious about how you came to Lincoln and we'll, we'll get to Douglas because we know that's a Rochester, you know, that's part of it. But how did you come to the civil war in Lincoln? You're interested obviously in Rome, you're interested in Liberty. Right. Why did that coalesce around Lincoln? Right. And I, I was considering doing my doctoral dissertation on, um, initially under father Fort and on Dante. That's so, a very different take. <laughs> So Dante, so Dante to Lincoln. I want Dante, to hear this from story. Dante to Lincoln. I went to Catholic University. Um, <clears throat> I, it, it's interesting. It, it, there, um, the Civil War was, I think, because of um, Northern Virginia, was very much in the air in in Washington D.C. And there was a. Um, a group that remains, you know, Lincoln is is popular, but uh, there's also strong currents uh, that, from both the left and the right that, that criticize Lincoln. And there was a critique. Uh, some of my my friends at, at Catholic University were highly critical of Lincoln and would, um, um, you know, uh, appeal to these book, this book by Emmy Bradford, um, the 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 um, one of the his chapters was the heresy of of equality, and I became interested in the debate between Bradford and Harry V. Jaffa, um, who uh, I think is one of the greatest scholars of Lincoln. He's a political philosopher uh, from uh, Claremont. He was at Claremont for many years. Um, I also was studying Aquinas, and I was uh, with a with a. He'll probably disavow me now because he didn't like Lincoln himself. <laughs> that was with a, a guy, Russ Hittinger. He was, he was brilliant and, and um, a great person. Um, uh, but he, he had a different take on Lincoln. And um, so I think some of these, some of the critiques of Lincoln actually forced me to dive a little deeper. And I, and I became enthralled. And um, I also... Uh, Became. I wanted to do. I think work in the American area, an American political thought, and I was working with Phil Henderson, who was an amazing Eisenhower okay. scholar. And and there was a kind of a you know, common interest in American political thought and American things. And I really just I began to see Lincoln as is a great thinker, and was uh, struck by the profundity of his thought, and then. All the questions I was interested in as a political philosopher, law and morality, religion and politics, um, uh, these, you know, the, the, the natural law, natural rights, um, the, the difference between human positive law and natural law and, and how to, you know, close the gap between the two, that I... I, you saw this playing out in practice during the Civil War era. Mm -hmm. It is really a battle of, of ideas as well as bayonets. So I thought it was a way to apply political philosophy to the American experience and, and to look at it through that lens. And that's, that's what got me into Lincoln. So would you say that Lincoln is, uh, uh, and the answer may be both, but is he more pragmatic as a statesman or idealistic? It you know, it's, that's a great question. And I, in my book, and I, I contrast his leadership to pr pragmatism, which pragmatism is often used in a, in a good sense or associated with prudence. But sometimes it has a more pejorative sense when you say the person's being merely pragmatic, that they're unprincipled or a little short on principle and they act on the basis of expediency or short-term success. Right. So I, 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 I position Lincoln's prudent 
statesmanship, and prudence is the virtue of practical wisdom, and uh, applying, you know, it can be defined in many different ways, applying principles under the circumstances, adapting just means to just ends, but it also, it always involves um, practical uh, uh, circumstances and actions and deliberation, deliberating on certain means to reach just ends, right? It's the realm of, of human um, reason and, and uh, deliberation. So I contrast that to a pragmatism, and, and if prudence, you know, properly applies and considers principles and under the circumstances is, is right reason in, in matters of, of moral and political action, then pragmatism is, let's say, short-sighted when it comes to moral principle. And, you know, the pragmatist, for example, is someone who, um, uh, you know, seeks uh, short-term success, you know, well, doesn't really have any strong moral compass. Uh, it's right, the, it's, it's, the, the, it's the end justifies the, the means. Yes, right, yeah. and, and, uh, and it's really self-interest um, or, or some other expedient measure. And at the same time, you have the, the idealist, let's say, on the other end, and that's, that's the person who fixates on moral principles and their abstract purity and is blind to the contingencies, to the limits of politics. Prudence implies a certain moderation that recognizes politics as the art of the possible. And that and that gets and to... And that's a virtue. That, we need to bring that back. Right. But that gets to, with Lincoln, you know, that idea, that statement, that quote that, that uh, you know, is, is bastardized all the time, but where he says, I would... You know, for the sake of the union, I would free all my, the slaves, or I would free none of the slaves. Yeah, the letter to Greeley, he, he lays out, you know, my paramount object in this struggle is to save the union. If I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. If I could save it by freeing none of the slaves, I would do it. If I could save it by freeing some and leaving others in slavery, I would do it. Of course, a, mu um, a month before this, he had already written a preliminary draft of the of the, of the, the emancipation, emancipation we know in retrospect. Right. And of course, preserving the union for Lincoln means preserving the principles for which it stood. And, the, right. Which, which furthering equality under the circumstances. And, and was, the future opportunity to free all slaves. Yes. That if, if he, I, I think that Lincoln recognized that if they lost, then they would have no opportunity well, to do anything in the Confederacy. Well, we have we have that on on good um, testimony of Frederick Douglass, who meets Lincoln in eighteen sixty four. You are good at these transitions. Yes, yeah, so is <laughs> that a good transition? Yes, yeah, so I didn't. Am I transitioning too much? No, no. This oh, is perfect. I'm oh, serious. Okay. This is perfect. Um, <laughs> Please talk about Douglass. Well, this is this is fascinating, and D David. There's a lot of great Douglas scholars out there. David David Blight and James Oakes is you know amazing. I can't. It, it's like music. You start listing people, you feel guilty because you, you leave some people out. But um, those two in particular have really done great work. Um, Stauffer on on giants, um, but there's a lot of work that's been done illuminating this meeting between Douglas and Abraham Lincoln in 1864, um, Lincoln invites Douglas to the White House. And Douglas is astounded because Lincoln, first of all, looks despondent. He, he, mm. It's very touching. He reports on his appearance. Um, the Grant's campaign you know, to to take Richmond and and the East Coast is it's is, a grind. It's a stymied. bloody grind. It's a meat grinder. Yeah. The country's war weary. This is August of eighteen sixty four. The Copperheads are there's a working clamor. Against. There's a clamor for peace. Um, there's the fire in the rear, <laughs> as, as Lincoln called it. Right, the, these Copperheads uh, subverting. There's there's. There's impatience and uh, understandable with with Lincoln's suspension of the writ of habeas corpus and right. and uh, so and you know restriction the, of civil liberties and right. the, the one of those one of military those military trials arguments uh, against Lincoln uh, yeah. that um, you know the purest libertarians even today 
um, fault Lincoln for. Yep, and that's the suspension of, of a habeas corpus. That's an important uh, argument to have. Um, but I, I have a certain position on it. That's a different. St- Actually, yes. I'm going to do a podcast on it. Uh, I think when I when I uh, return. But so uh, Lincoln informs Douglas that he's likely to lose the election in eighteen in 1864, and and of course Lincoln's campaign manager Henry Raymond shares this bad news with Lincoln. He's getting it from many different sources, and. He asked Douglas to raise a band of African American scouts to spread the word of emancipation throughout the South. Uh, and in here, because uh, you know, not as not as many um, fugitives had had been escaping. Right, you know, and this he is wanted this to is, encourage more. I right, mean, there this, were there was a is, lot, but he wanted to encourage more before the Emancipation Proclamation gets. Revoked, right? Because this is now a year after yes. he has proclaimed it. It goes on into January first, eighteen sixty-three. So we're right. now in eighteen sixty-four. So we're beyond a year, and he and, and Lincoln feels still not enough slaves. More, know we about want, this. we want more. We want more freedom. We want, we want more slaves coming in line. Of course, uh, at this time, um, African Americans are fighting valiantly in the in the Union armies. Ultimately, there's about 200,000 um, who will fight for the Union. And Lincoln recognizes that the strides towards black freedom may be reversed. Right. And, you know, the country could opt for an ignoble peace. Yeah, right. Right? right. And right. so Douglas is astounded. And this is the plan that was initially or sim- very similar to the plan proposed by John Brown, right. an armed underground railroad. Harper's Ferry. That would subvert yeah. right the South, that would subvert slavery, encourage servile insurrection, um, and protect uh, freed persons, you know, seeking free you know, seeking freedom. Uh, or former slaves seeking freedom. So yeah, that was an, an astounding, very, very telling. Of course, uh, things change in September, late August, you know, early September with with Sherman's uh, capture of Atlanta. Right, Atlanta, and then on to Savannah and Christmas and, gift. And yes, the Christmas gift. I uh, I saw one time. I did uh, when I was still teaching history. I did a program in Savannah, and I was at the uh, the historical society there, and I got to see a reverse Xerox, essentially of the original handwritten note from Sherman to Lincoln that they used to for the, to transmit it over the telegraph but he writes and it's it just he writes that you know I I, I send to you a Christmas gift of yes. 25,000 bales of cotton, <laughs> cotton and, yeah. and the city of Savannah it is it's and he just dashes it off in his own hands and then it's sent by telegraph and it's just another one of those moments where you're you're sitting there going this is, I'm in the spot, I'm holding this sort of one or two generations removed of uh, the note that Sherman wrote for Lincoln that is uh, the, the one of those turning points that we're uh, heading, we're barreling toward the close of this chapter of American history. So Lincoln, Douglas, tell us about that relationship between the two of them. Tell us what Douglas uh, thought of Lincoln and uh, and certainly he survives him because it's it's not long after that it's uh, April fourteenth, eighteen sixty five, that Lincoln is assassinated after being reelected, and uh, and Douglas goes on to live another thirty years. Eighteen ninety five. Yeah. So tell us about that relationship between the two of them, and and where because because it seems like Douglas changed in his thinking about Lincoln, and part of that built on. The relationship they developed it part of it just as the years passed recognizing what Lincoln had done yeah I think that's fair um, Douglas is is notable for his uh, reversals and I, I always when I teach Douglas I tell my students that, you know Douglas was a great man and, and great people great men are capable of changing their views and it and it I think it speaks to his integrity, right? Mm-hmm. He wasn't rigid. Um, notably, 
Um, he, he shifts in his view on the Constitution when he breaks with William Lloyd Garrison. Mm-hmm. He initially sees the Constitution as a pro-slavery document, as a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. And then by 1852, uh, even earlier, um, it's a uh, glorious liberty document. So let's stop. Let's talk about that. Why? Because liberty is important for you. Liberty is important for Freedoms Foundation. Obviously, liberty is important for uh, Douglas. What? What? Where did that change come from? What did he? Yes. What did he come to know that 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 signified that his thinking needed to change? It's a it's a great story. Um, I think there's a this this book. This author Damon. Um, I think by by that name, Glorious Liberty, giving all these people plugs, they deserve credit. <laughs> um, did a nice nice work on on this, um, and something that I'm hoping to explore in further further detail and link it up, you know, with with Lincoln in this book that I'm working on. Um, he the one of the tenets of Garrisonian abolitionists is that the Constitution, the compromises that the Constitution had had sold out. Right. The glorious principles of the Declaration of Independence that, you know, it was a great start, but then it was <laughs> it was completely betrayed and, and undermined um, by the compromises made to And slavery. specifically the three-fifths compromise Three that we fifths, hear about. The, you know. the, the foreign slave trade, the, right. the fugitive slave provision, as they were called, uh, all these... Um, and that it national for for Garrison, um, the Constitution nationalized slavery, so it, it we were a nation dedicated to human servitude and and white supremacy in this sense. Um, Douglas begins his career as a Garrisonian after he after he escapes and he, he meets Garrison about eighteen forty one um, in person. He was aware of Garrison goes on the speaking circuit with Garrison. He begins his own paper, right, in, in my wonderful city of Rochester, New York, and um, the North Star and Garrison. You know, we see the, the rifts with Garrison are And, of course, Garrison's starting. got the liberator. Garrison has the liberator. He's perturbed to say, you know, that's probably a, a nice way of saying it yeah. with Douglas because Douglas starts his own newspaper. Then Douglas... Um, within the upstate New York area uh, begins to engage in dialogue with a group known as the, um, the the political abolitionists. And they're kind of, I think in some ways, unsung heroes. Folks like um, Garrett Smith, Jared Smith, um, uh, Lysander Spoonder, he, Goldel, he gives, he, he mentions these people. Garrett Smith had had um, was was a millionaire at the at the time and mm-hmm. had supported many uh, abolitionist causes, and uh, had had helped support Douglas's newspaper, um, and Douglas announces his change in the North Star. He says, you know, uh, sense of duty and obligation uh, obliges him to officially and publicly announce his change of opinion that the Constitution is now a freedom document that is anti-slavery, and that beautiful quote, should be wielded for emancipation. Oh, right? I mean, it should be, I the love Constitution it. should be wielded for emancipation. And um, because he was declared anathema by the Garrisonian abolitionists, that, right. that, that, who's anti-American, uh, I'm sorry, anti uh, uh, American anti-slavery society uh, would not accept this dissenting viewpoint, right? That right. the slavery may be well and, pro-freedom. And, and I mean, that the Constitution us, may be pro-freedom. And sorry, it brings it, that's, no, no. It, but it brings us back to this pragmatism, prudence, idealism. That you know, Garrison is the idealist. I think so, yes. Uh, they, they are the ones who are like, this is morally wrong. It has to be obliterated immediately. And any any other viewpoint from that 
Uh, and not that not that is anathema. Right. It's anathema. But not that Douglas would have disagreed with that. But again, it seems like there's a prudence there that says, yes. you know, we 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 got to figure out how to get there. I think, you know, Kevin Green talked about, you know, baby steps that sometimes it's, you know, you just you take small steps to get there. You know, it's one stair at a time. It's not jumping, you know, 10 stairs. Uh, he's yes. like, some people can jump 10 stairs. Other people have to go one stair at a time. Yeah. And and but you get there. And yeah, and I mean Douglas. Douglas had the vision and and was far ahead of others in in terms of a, a, a multiracial democracy. And but also he was prudent in terms of not only that end, the justice of the end of you know, and justice demanding that, and the principles pointing to that, but also the, the means throughout his career he took right to attain that end. You know, Garrison, the Garrisonians were apolitical or even anti-political that you couldn't either vote uh, against slavery. That was anathema. uh, Nor could you run for office uh, because this would taint you, right? That you can't, you know, you disavow any allegiance to the covenant with death, and if you're involved in the political process, the then voting, you're with then you're, co- you're corrupted, right? right. So right. You, they rely enti- entirely on denunciation and moral suasion. Right, it's moral suasion. That was the phrase yes. I remember always teaching my, my American suasion. history students yes. is, you know, William Garrison, you know, William Lloyd Garrison it, and moral suasion. Those two things go together. The Second Great Awakening, yes. he's he very much yes. influenced by this, and that it could create a revival and reform. Um, but... Uh, so uh, unlikely to. I I I want to I want to give you just the the opportunity to speak to Frederick Douglass and the Constitution and ultimately he's born a slave he uh, escapes uh, on on his own he comes to this transformation in understanding the Constitution as this liberty document and not a pro-slave document, mm-hmm. where does he where does he end his life as far as the, that belief in the American system? Because it's 1895, it's right. 30 years on from the end of the Civil War. Where is he in his own? He was of- extremely distressed and rightfully so about the uh, Civil Rights Acts, which were passed roughly um, not. I'm sorry, the civil rights cases, which which really stripped the many of the, the provisions right. of and the is it 1894 is Plessy versus Ferguson? 1896. 1896. So that's going to so come the year, the year after, after, he, after dies, he dies. And, he, and, and, and he, he sees this and it, it, it eviscerates many of the, the yeah. protections he knows for the coming. freedmen. Oh, I think he anticipates yeah. it because he sees the direction that the court is, is moving in. You know, and I, right. I tell my students for every... For every court decision you applaud, there's one you could possibly condemn. You know, the court giveth and the court taketh away. And right, I think that's right. how how Douglas felt. Not, you know, they, they misread, I think they grossly misread um, the the Bill of Rights here, the, the 14th Amendment as well as uh, the Constitution. Um, but it, uh, you know, it institutionalized Jim Crow in right. effect, right? That right. that was the effect of all of, of these. And um, Douglas was chagrined. But the thing about Douglas is that he never loses hope. There's always a, um, a hopeful note um, to go forward. He has this tenacity, this resilience. And I remind students of that. I think he's a great example of a... You know, uh, a patriot who who could be, you know, at the same time in the best way critical of the country, wants the best for the country, can be critical, right? Um, um, and yet, still supportive. You know, yeah, yes. supports the core principles and prophetically, you know, condemns the country when it betrays itself. Um, but also allowing hope. It's not Douglas is not a cynic. I don't think he's mm-hmm. not. He's not. He's not a cynic. He's not a separatist. Right. He's not a cynic. Not, not that that's the same thing. But he's not a separatist. He's not a cynic. Um, he he really believes in the possibility of a, of a multiracial democracy, of freedom for all, um, and uh, you know his his. There's a famous statement where uh, someone, a young person, asks him, 
you know, towards the end of Douglas's life, what, you know, what, rec- what, what would you, what would you do? What advice would you give me? He says, agitate, agitate, agitate. Mm. So, and that's, and you will see his successors in Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois and eventually into the civil rights movement sure. and, and Martin Luther King sure, and said, all of them in some ways are, and that movement is descended from Frederick Douglass. And, well, he's a giant, right? Yeah. He's a giant in, in, in American history. He's a, he's, a, he's a giant in telling the story of of African Americans in, in, in making that story known to whites in, in, in 1845, when right. people thought, many people, you know, thought slavery was a benign institution. Right. And public right. opinion had to be Right, because molded, for decades you know, they've and, been saying, and, oh, we, we take care of our right. slaves. It's and paternalistic, we, we, yes. let's, or, or, you know, mind your own business. Right, yeah. Mind your own business. This yeah. is our peculiar yeah. institution. Well, there's there's always more to say, but I do want to talk before we wrap up here just a little bit about America today. We, we, we are, I am particularly interested in the state that we find ourselves in, political polarization. And, mm-hmm. and there was a, a really interesting but disheartening Pew research poll uh, that just came out uh, that says that uh, 77% of Americans think the country will be more divided in 20. 50 than it is today. And then when we couple that with the recent um, NAEP scores on civics and history that showed that 22% of eighth graders scored proficient in civics and 13% in American history. Mm. Um, so we've got this lack of, um, of civic knowledge. And then we couple that with, you know, people saying, you know, three quarters of people poll be saying, the, the country is on the path to being further divided than it is today. You know, the, how do we overcome this? How do we find uh, a way? And what might Lincoln and Douglas, you know, uh, speak to mm-hmm. this situation that we find? Because they're, they're living in the most divided time ever. Right. We're literally, that's, that's exactly we split right. into two countries where literally we are at war, brother against brother, you know, uh, family against family. And so um, we're not there yet. I'm not at all, you know, but, you know, th- but, but things, uh, you know, people feel that there is a gloom uh, and 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 I, what I read from this poll is people don't know how we escape this, how we get how we get any better. That in twenty years, in thirty years, that it's just going to be worse. And I'm I'm so I'm curious what you think, Douglas or Lincoln or any of the great statesmen that you believe in, you know, would would say for our time. I think we need to revive a proper patriotism, and. We could look to Douglas as a great example of that. You know, someone who, uh, an outsider, who was, uh, you know, in exile from the political system, and follow his personal odyssey, and recognize that one can have gratitude for, you know, one's country, and ought to have gratitude and even um, love. And, and a sense of obligation to others <laughs> um, and to, to succeeding generations and a sense of gratitude for the uh, sacrifice of the past and still be and still be critical in a balanced manner. Um, you know, we could avoid the, the, the extreme of jingo, jingoistic nationalism sure. and sure. triumphalism on the one hand, and which, you know, we want to make all the, the entire world in the image of America. Um, <laughs> or, uh, on the other hand, a kind of cynicism that only sees our history as despicable um, and uh, a, a history of, of victimization and, and oppression. There's, there's a mean, and, but it also, I think, requires sensitive teachers um, and... Uh, it, and, and, it, and it requires um, thoughtfulness. It, co- it requires engagement. Um, I think one thing I love about Freedom's Foundation is that is the diversity of, of teachers uh, and their political views as well as the geographic, racial, ethnic, gender. There's diversity 
amongst these this this these group of teachers and listening to them. But we're all on the same page in the sense that um, and I you know here I am I'm a college professor but I do I feel solidarity. This is part of my calling that you know you, you don't you don't want to be dictated in terms of what you teach by you know there there should be guidelines but but no one wants censorship whether it's coming from the right or whether it's coming from um, the left and that's not to say that parents don't have a role sure. but 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 um, I'm I I think it's 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 to find a way in you know in terms of civic education uh, I still have trust in it to to strike that mean that goal of patriotism without blinding ourselves to the sins of the past. Right. But rather not, but neither, you know, history is not simply, you know, uh, uh, American history is a tale told of, of oppression. Um, but it's, it's not, you know, to use a pun fully intended, we shouldn't whitewash history. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. History either. You know, it, history um, is, history is complex. And there's, and there's, there, we, we, we can do that. Yeah. I think I, I we can we can absolutely do that. We can have dialogue, we can have conversation, we can have we can have great books that are loose canons. Mm-hmm. Right? Frederick I would include Narrative of the Rife of a Slave is one of the, the the great books not only in America but uh you know, in all human history. But right. I'm but I'm also inclusive. There's other voices that can be I don't think not, I don't feel threatened by any of this um and that's and that's a choice and And that 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 i think that's something really if we you know that that to choose to not feel threatened to choose to engage engage with people who think differently than you do and not look for the the social media uh, echo chamber right that is that is repeating back to you that what you already believe and the things that you want to know and it thrives off the polarization right it just and I'm not saying there's there's divisions. Look, I also say, listen, within the diversity, the, the, for for this diversity to be productive, which I believe it is, a, a champion of diversity, um, it has it it also presumes a unity. Right. And our national motto, "E pluribus unum," is worth preserving, and maybe a way of approaching um, an ordered patriotism. It's it's. The unity does not abolish the pluralism, but the pluralism uh, exists within the context of the unity. And I would say that that that's our that unity is our our core principles. Right. You know, and and here here I may disagree um, with others who say that our our principles were false when they were written, and and um, there's no opportunity, and that we you know people of different races or groups can't live together. Um, that there's always a suspicion and an oppression that's that's there, um, I, I, you know. The, the the diversity occurs within the context of our of our common humanity and the inalienable rights we share. Right, and and, and but with that common humanity comes frailty, and and that's part of what we have to overcome. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's the, these are human institutions. You know, every right. government is made up of human well, beings. Father and Fortin, Father Fortin's uh, Augustinianism uh, left a big impact on me uh, yeah. in terms of my view of politics, and that's what I I tell people: Are you a are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? Are you liberal? Because I'm an Augustinian. <laughs> because I think I think everyone is flawed. I That's it. Original sin has taken its I'm, toll on everyone. So more, I distrust power and all its concentrations. More and more, yeah. that's where um, I keep coming back to is the the f- often how often the frailties of our our civic institutions are really the frailties of the human beings who are involved in them Mm -hmm. and that again that uh a little bit of grace that if we can just find a way to offer a little bit of grace particularly to the people that we disagree with and particularly for um, those whose viewpoints we struggle to understand it would go a long way toward um, f- you know managing to find some kind of common ground that's right and recognizing as John Stuart Mill says they always teach my students this that there's there's truth there's there's partial truth in the opinions you know, of, of, of those you disagree with. Well, we're going to wrap up with quiz. 
Uh, oh, is this for me? This is for you. Oh, no. Yeah. So oh, good, no. the I, good I, thing I, is you didn't have to study. So I'm in trouble. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, Excluding. I'm undermine my credibility. Now not completely. at all. all you, right. you, everyone can pass. Uh, right. Excluding <laughs> Washington and Lincoln, who's your favorite president? Oh, that's a great question. I got. I think. I think my my uh, my professor um, Phil Henderson. Really, I, I think. It, I think it might be Eisenhower. Okay, isn't it crazy? Our, and and one of our founders, our founding I, I, chairman. Yeah, I think more. The more I learn about Eisenhower, the more I I uh, ad, admire him. Yes, as, as president, I, I keeping agree. us out of war and. Uh, what and, he did for and education, just, you know, level-headed and um, and again, uh, you know, was was not interested in uh, engaging in politics mm-hmm. the way a politician might. This was the savior of Europe engaged in politics, right. and that was a very different. I may, thing. I may, I may um, have a friend Elizabeth Spalding who's written on Truman, and I might, I might throw Truman in the mix too. Mm-hmm. Just the, the tenacity, and he made mistakes, but you, you just so human and and he came in at such a such a difficult time uh, uh so, so uh next question what's one thing you want every american to learn more about right now i want everybody american to learn more about frederick Douglass. okay i love it uh if you had not chosen to become a political philosopher and we never really got to delve into what that means particularly but if you hadn't become a political philosopher your your chosen uh descriptor what would you have become does it a high school teacher does that count That's absolutely oh, yeah yeah, yeah. I'd, yeah. Be, I'd want to be a high school teacher okay. and i was well and you were and yes. so yeah. yeah you could have made a, an entire yeah, career I thought of, i've thought about becoming a chef okay but it's uh that's a it's a real yeah. it's a tough life the yeah. hours and yeah. and yeah uh, what pet peeve annoys you the most? Well, you'd be surprised. I, 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 uh, leaf blowers. Oh, really? <laughs> it, 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 it drives, it, it, I know my neighbors, I'm a nice guy. It just, I, I, I think being a musician or something, it's when they, it's when they go on, it, it, it drives me crazy. I can't think. Yeah. I, I, so we, every Tuesday we have during the summer, spring and summer, we have, uh, uh, the landscaping crew come in and cut and blow leaves. And, and inevitably, they are outside my office window whenever I've got a Zoom a, meeting. A, a little but, bit. You yeah. know, a little bit of yeah. leaf blowing. Uh, it's a great invention. Yeah. Sure. But but when, when your Saturday afternoon is destroyed by leaf blowing and I can't listen to John Coltrane or, or you know, I can't, I can't play my guitar or... You know, I can't talk to my friends because I'm hearing the leaf blowers. We got to put mufflers on those I, I things. I love it. I love it. Okay. Sorry. Favorite movie. What's your favorite movie? Oh, my goodness. We were just we were just talking about that. What's my favorite? I, you know, I wish I could say, you know, I, I wish I could say something profound, but I, I'm such a product of the '80s, and and so the Blues Brothers. Oh, I love that movie. You know, I, the I Blues Brothers wore is that, my favorite movie. And I wore I loved that. Belushi and yep. Aykroyd and yep. the. Yep. And and uh, Ray Charles is oh, it? Aretha has Aretha, a, has a cameo, which cameo I I in the remember restaurant. Aretha singing "Think" <laughs> was just when well, we had both the album and the VHS tape and so funny uh, and, and Cab Calloway and Cap, you know, from being, Rochester originally being introduced yeah. to this man who you know you know was like there at the there at the Harlem Renaissance yes. and and here he is. Um, you know, doing that dream sequence and James, James Brown, Brown in the I, church. Oh, it was it was brilliant. just um, oh, what the, a great r- one. But the uh, the penguin. Yes. Don't yes, forget yes. the penguin in this the beginning. You know? Okay. So, let's, uh, let, let's see. What one lesson from Lincoln or Douglas or any of their scholarly work would you want young people to know? There's so many. I'm sorry. That's why it's it's not the number. I gotta I gotta just pick I gotta just pick one here. Well, I would it would be do unto others, but maybe that's no, uh, as, that's, as they would have that's great. do unto you, and that's of course becomes the uh, the guiding you know a principle of equality as well, and a principle against slavery, right? Right. Um, that 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 golden rule is still still needs to be taught, and hopefully gets us out of narcissism. And it's so simple and yet so profound. Yeah, and so. it's it's there. It's there. It's there in Douglas. It's there in Lincoln. 
No. It's not there in John C. Calhoun. No. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> okay. Bourbon or scotch? Oh, bourbon. Okay. Excellent. Well, uh, Joe Fornieri, thank you for being on the show today. What a great conversation. Thank you so much. I also want to thank our producers, Laura Kennedy and Sarah Rasmussen, and a special shout out to friend of the pod, Bill Franz, for his art design on the logo. Special thanks to longtime Freedoms Foundation historic interpreter, Bob Gleason, for his contributions to the intro. And most of all, I want to thank all of you, our listeners. Please subscribe, follow, rate, and review George Washington Slept Here wherever you listen to podcasts and tell your friends. If you want to check out Freedoms Foundation at Valley Forge, just go to our website, www.freedomsfoundation.org, and follow us on social media or email us at gwshpodcast at gmail.com with your comments, questions, or suggestions. That's it for today. We look forward to next time.